Welcome to our Let's Connect Leaders webinar. It is so great to see all of you tonight. My name is Unju Park. I am a Shining Waters Regional Minister for Pastoral Relations and Communities of Faith Support. This webinar is for both Shining Waters and Canadian Shield regions. And the land, uh, both of our regions are situated, is richly blessed and cared for by the various groups of Indigenous people. And we are grateful for their stewardship of the land. As our areas are vast, I would like to invite you to acknowledge the territories where you are joining from in the chat. Tonight, I am joining you from Hamilton, Ontario, which is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron, Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. The land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon, One Spoon Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. This land is covered by the Between the Lakes purchased 1792 between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the uh, Credit First Nation. Now, both Canadian Shield and Shining Waters Regional Councils are also an affirming ministry where we proclaim and thrive to live our faith that God's love is wider and more encompassing than we can imagine. Therefore, we affirm, include, and celebrate diversity in age, health, race, ethnicity, gender identity, and sexual orientation, and many more. We are intentionally creating safe space where opportunities exist for all to participate according to their gifts and talents in all aspects of the life and ministry of the regional councils. Will you join me in a prayer? Let us pray. Creator God, you have gifted us with many different talents and we are to share those gifts with others. Tonight, we gather together to receive gifts that, that are offered to us through management advisory service that are useful for our ministry in our congregations. We are grateful for the service offered, and we are grateful for the ministry service we provide in our faith communities. We ask your blessings on the uh, presenters, participants in our time together. Amen. Tonight with me um, co-leading this webinar is uh, Melody Duncanson um, Hills. Um, she is the staff person from uh, Canadian Shield, and she will monitor the chat for Q&A times. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to um, type in, um, in the chat. Our presenters, the real presenters tonight are Brian Truckwar and Mark Elwood. I am going to let them introduce themselves in a moment, but I just want to say that we were so thrilled when Brian reached out to us and offered mass service to both regions. They bring excellent um, expertise in various areas like property, finances, fundraising, human resources, technology, et cetera, and et cetera. So Brian and Mark, Thank you so much for coming tonight and letting us know what you can offer that we can use in our ministry. We look forward to hearing your presentation. Over to you, Brian. Thank you and welcome everyone on behalf of uh, Mark and myself. Uh, we're both members of Mass and we're going to share uh, our presentation with you this evening uh, and then hopefully a follow up with, uh, with a Q&A. Um, uh, we were motivated to do this because we've each done some work for some United Churches. And we thought perhaps there could be some wider application. So the, the goal is to introduce and to let you learn more about it. So I'm going to share my screen here. So I'm Brian and also Mark will join the presentation. So first, why we're here and do some introductions. Um, this is an introduction to management advisory service. And uh, what we offer is really free consulting or bono consulting. 
uh, hopefully the people here on this call are leaders and problem solvers. Um, you know, what we try to do is, is work um, uh, with churches, with charities, nonprofits, and help them solve problems. Uh, we don't do it on our own, uh, but we work hand in hand and that works really well. So our goal tonight is to provide a presentation uh, to try to let you see perhaps how we could help. Um, and, uh, and at the end, we'll, we'll do it as a Q&A, uh, and hopefully we can identify either individually or as a group how we might uh, help United Churches uh, in the regions. So um, I've been a, a mass volunteer since 2017 uh, when I retired. Um, I do a lot of finance and IT projects and also some strategy and governance. I come from the software industry, uh, but a lot of uh, time with uh, the United Church of Canada. I've been the treasurer of Run Me United Church in, in Toronto for 30 plus years. I'm also a board member, a trustee, member of MP, and all those other committees everybody in this call knows. I was also treasurer of the Toronto West Presbytery Corp of UCC for about 10 years. So uh, I, I, I feel uh, deep roots right back from Sunday school as a child uh, through to today as, as a member and participant in the United Church of Canada. I'm now going to turn it over to, uh, to, uh, to Mark for his introduction. So I'm Mark Elwood, and there I am. I've got 46 years of business experience. Good gosh. I joined, uh, we call it Mass or Management Advisory Service. So I joined Mass about 2004. Uh, way back in my career, I started in uh, marketing with Procter & Gamble. Started my own company uh, in 1989. I do a lot of productivity work and time studies, and I also do facilitation. So the work that I do here for Mass, I also do professionally. Uh, and there I am uh, since uh, 2004. So here's the topics uh, that we're going to go over tonight. Uh, so we'll tell you a little bit about Mass, uh, how we how it works, um, where we can help you, and we're going to give you some examples of work that we did for uh, some of the United Churches that we've worked with, and uh, then maybe talk about some next steps. Um, so uh, when we look at uh, Mass. We are a charitable organization founded in 1993. There was a small group of volunteers. We tend to be retired people. Now, I started when I was about 48. You can guess my age now. Uh, but but it tends to be uh, retired folks um, with a lot of expertise. Uh, and they wanted to create a, a mechanism matching their skills uh, with charities that needed help. So here's our mission statement. Mass provides volunteer consulting to help sustain and grow Canada's not-for-profit sector, especially organizations supporting marginalized communities. Okay, so who are we then? Uh, there's my picture way up in the top right-hand corner. I think I've got my arms out or something. Anyway, there's about 50 of us, and we're volunteer consultants from a whole range of different fields. So it tends to be uh, strategic planning, uh, finance, uh, fundraising, some IT, some marketing, HR. So we've got all those different uh, backgrounds and we come together. And typically each uh, project comes, uh, each uh, VC or volunteer consultant takes on projects in their areas of expertise. So, well, how does this work? Um, so we, we do our consulting mostly here in Toronto and the GTA. But, you know, we can do remote stuff as well. So I've traveled a uh, little ways out of the city, uh, but we've got some remote projects for sure. So, you know, if someone came up to us from across the country, we'd do that. In my case, I do facilitation and I like to be in the room with people. But some of our other consultants for sure have done lots of virtual projects. And we got really good at that when uh, when COVID happened. So we work with all types and sizes of uh, not-for-profit organizations. Some of them are just small startups. Uh, some of them are really big uh, organizations. Uh, it's, a, it's a real range. They're either not-for-profits or they're charities. We don't tend to work with political groups like the Liberal Party or somebody like that. Um, so uh, we get our volunteers, the 50 of us or so, uh, from a variety of different disciplines. And we've got a pretty stringent onboarding process. We're looking people with a, a, a good amount of experience in their field. Uh, we're looking for expertise in the, in the areas that we tend to operate. And we go through a, a stringent uh, uh, volunteer, sorry, uh, onboarding and uh, recruiting process. We have our own code of conduct. 
and uh, confidentiality. So you'll hear a little bit of a couple of projects we did tonight, but really nothing uh, that that's uh, confidential. So um, we do roughly a hundred different uh, or works with a hundred different not-for-profits a year. Uh, we've done projects over 1,500 clients uh, since our inception, typically about 150 per year, although we've bumped up into the 200 range. And some of them can be fairly long. Some of them are fairly short. So it could take a couple of months. Maybe there's a series of meetings or something like that. Uh, or it could be just a single meeting. So for instance, I've done governance training and we just come in or I'd come in and do a two hour session for a board of directors on governance. Uh, I've got a fundraising one that's uh, either one six hour session or two three hour sessions. On the other hand, uh, there may be quite a number of different interventions where we're involved uh, that could take a, a two or three months or maybe longer. Um, we mostly work individually, so it's a single consultant uh, because it's a fairly focused uh, request that happens. But um, we've we've teamed up uh, in other projects, and Brian and I are looking to team up on some of this uh, some of this work that we're doing. So, um, you know, how would a project work? Well, we've got a, a form. It's called a request for consulting services. We call it RCS. Anyway, so so you, the client. Uh, would fill that out. And it asks who you are and what your needs are and so forth. So that we can be really clear uh, ab about how everything, how everything works and what you're looking for. Um, we have an internal coordinator. We also have an executive director. Um, so we'll make sure we, the, the coordinator will make sure everything's uh, correct and, and uh, conforms with, with what we need or what you need. Um, so then those requests get circulated to all of our volunteer consultants. Here's our outstanding projects. And someone will sort of virtually put up their hand and say, hey, that, that's of interest to me. I'll take that one on or sometimes two. Um, and so then those projects get assigned. So it starts with you. It comes into us. The project gets circulated around and uh, then somebody chooses it. And we don't often say this, but not all get accepted, almost all, but you, you know, to some degree, you want to make it attractive for, for our consultants to get involved with. Well, there's the nature of your organization, of course, but you don't want to go rambling on with a whole bunch of different needs. If the, the ones that tend to be more precise in terms of their needs tend to get picked up a little faster. Um, so we define what the project is. And then at the very end, we have a project close uh, that happens, and then we get feedback from you. The project might take different forms. There might be another consultant uh, that's involved, or there might be a second project that falls out of it. Or you might call us back in a year, and you might say, I would like that same consultant again to do some follow-up so follow work. So that's kind of how we work. And uh, now Brian will take it over and talk about the different areas. Thanks, Mark. <clears throat> Um, lots of different areas. Uh, you see them here on the slide. And um, sometimes they're big and involved. Sometimes they're quite tactical. Um, uh, we try to address whatever the problem is. Um, one of the things we do um, after the RCS is submitted and we discuss it, we have that first meeting. We really try to figure out what is the real problem that needs to be addressed. And this is done, obviously, consultatively. Um, because sometimes it's the old story, sometimes you talk about a symptom and we actually say, well, what's, what's behind that? And we try to uh, make sure we understand it and then we define what it is we're gonna do. So these are the areas and I'm just gonna go through uh, each one of these and give you a sense of what it is we uh, are about. Strategic planning probably represents maybe 30 to 40% of all of our projects, uh, including facilitation. So examples, you know, if you're a church, you need a strategic plan. Uh, we won't write a strategic plan for you, but we'll help you with the process. We'll tell you what's good and bad about it. We may uh, convene meetings, interview stakeholders with you, and so on. Um, uh, we can assist if churches are considering an amalgamation. Um, um, and that obviously would involve typically both uh, or both churches, but not necessarily, because there's a lot involved there um, uh, that range from the spiritual to the practical to the financial to the logistics and so on. So we can help in that. Uh, sometimes uh, a church will run into a situation where we need a special leadership meeting, um, uh, not ones that are, we require like a Shining Waters or other regional representation, that, that kind of thing, but maybe it's a difficult topic. You need someone to help you through that, and we can do that. Uh, we can help create operating plans. You know, how do you, we have a strategy, how do we get from here to there? 
uh, we can help people assess the consistency of programs with mission. You know, here's our mission. Here's what we're doing. Does this jive? Does this make sense? And sometimes, uh, as churches, we're always trying to reach to do more than what we have in the past. Uh, what are the implications? You know, how how would we get there? What are the steps required? And what are the resource implications? And uh, if you're very sophisticated, just describing and designing outcome measures. You know, the new program. How is it working? And not just activities, but real outcomes and impacts. So we can help in all these areas of, of strategic planning. A second area is governance and board development. And by we say board, it's whatever your structure is, um, you know, because obviously there's different models, including unified boards and so on. So we can examine and explore governance models if you're considering changing that. Um, if you have a board, and you don't feel you're really operating correctly as a board, um, we can help establish a governance framework, look at bylaw issues, improve recruitment orientation programs, and just try to increase the effectiveness of, of a board and try to then value, uh, maximize the value of committees and other supporting structures. Uh, you know, we're all involved in, in our churches and there's a lot of complexity. It's usually volunteers um, and people have different levels of experience in how governance should work. Um, and that's also part of the culture of, of your organization. So we can help assess, you know, do you have good governance? How could it be improved? What are the implications and how would you do it? Finance and IT management, uh, particularly finance. Um, uh, churches are always struggling. How do we solve this problem? How do we do accounting? How do we do stewardship? How do we do membership management? How do we manage our properties, uh, rentals, and, and all the things that are our day-to-day -day life of a church? Um, you know, what's the process you can do that? Um, we can help doing a financial analysis or amalgamations or reduction in staff and scale, because uh, that's uh, you know easy and straightforward for us, but sometimes hard for for church to really get down to the nub of it. Work through options and solutions on deficits. Um, review financial reporting, uh, which varies quite a lot between churches. Um, uh, there's a difference between bookkeeping and accounting, and and sometimes uh, governance structure isn't getting the reporting it needs. Um, finance management and policies, helping write policies or assess policies to make sure they're appropriate, as well as accounting controls. Uh, provide budgeting and forecasting best practice. Um, you know, how, how, do you, how do you budget, how do you forecast, and, and how do you have a, an ongoing plan that's effective for everyone? Uh, looking at financial risk management. Maybe you want to do something that's out of the norm, um, and you want to have someone to help you assess financially. What would this, where, where are the risks? How do we mitigate them and so on? And system assessment feasibility. Uh, is this the best software to use for this uh, problem? What are what are our options? Uh, uh, how do we how do we choose something and so on? So um, from numbers to to tech and and everything in the, in the middle. Marketing communications, especially for Mark. So um, we're all trying to reach out. Uh, we want to reach out into our congregation, into our communities, uh, and both marketing and communication matters desperately for that. How do you clarify messaging to inspire people and donations? Uh, do you have a communications or a branding plan you need to work with? Um, what are the implications? Or what do I need to do to implement a big marketing communication plan project? And how do you build a, a longer-term brand strategy? And I know we're churches, we don't really talk about brand, but when you talk about what makes us different and why we want people to join us in our membership here, in the end, you are talking a little bit about brand. So some of these words are not church words, but they still apply in the United Church world. Fundraising, there's never enough money. Um, so this can be stewardship, uh, raising money from your congregation. It could be fundraising for projects or, or other, uh, other elements. It could be engaging with the community or with partners, all kinds of fundraising. We have expertise in trying to work with uh, organizations on how to do fundraising and how to evaluate how well it went, uh, including you know, what kind of structure you need for a committee. Uh, how, do you, uh, how do you get uh, funding proposals together? And what, how, what's the approach you take? So fundraising is, uh, is the fifth area. Uh, and the sixth is really human resources. You know, we can assist in policy development for ministry and personnel committees um, and also systems. Uh, leadership development and coaching uh, is part of what we do. Um, uh, and that can be at an individual or a group basis. Um, we look at uh, communications and morale strategies. You know, how do we uh, make things better in terms of how people feel? Effective recruiting and interviewing strategies. Organizational planning and development. Um, change process, volunteer recruitment and management, all the uh, the, the parts of um, a church or any nonprofit or charity, you know, the, your, your staff team and, and, and your volunteers have to be meshing and work well for you to be successful. So we, we work on all those things uh, as well. Um, 
so just pause for a moment. Um, those are the general things. What we thought we'd do now is uh, walk you through some examples. Uh, and uh, confidentiality, as Mark noted, very important to us. So everything you see here has been cleared with these churches. So we've said, may we speak, may we use this slide, and they've said yes. And uh, also to Mark's point, we, we won't get into a lot of detail about them because um, uh, these churches are engaged in important processes and uh, we want to uh, preserve that. Um, and not all of our projects are listed here because some said uh, we'd rather not be listed and that's fine too. So uh, we're gonna go, I'm gonna go through the ones I've been working on and then um, uh, Mark will do his. Uh, at that point, we'll be done the presentation and we'll uh, see if you have questions. So Kingston Road uh, United Church uh, approached us uh, because they have a very large annual deficit. Um, it's uh, one of these structural ones and not something happened once, it's there. Uh, and they're, they're trying to cope with what do we do about this um, and how, what's our path forward um, you know, for multiple years. Uh, so they needed some assistance on assessing their financial sustainability, like well, how do you see this and their staffing models. Um, so what uh, we did is we created a, a financial model uh, that both had history and budget and forecast in it uh, to try to really assess, you know, what are the main issues that you're facing? Um, what's causing the deficit? And where are the issues? Meetings with their executive and others to work through scenarios. What well, could we do this? Could we do that? And then helping them prepare uh, information to educate the board and subsequently the congregation. Uh, you know, what's the next step? What things we want to consider? Um, so this is a project that was over a, a number of months, um, you know, number number of meetings and engagements, um, and combination of in-person and remote. Um, uh, and this Kingston Road is in, in Toronto. Another example is Bloor Street United Church, um, uh, obviously a, a, a large church in, in downtown Toronto. Uh, and as you may or may not know, the, a, a big property redevelopment underway there, uh, which will ultimately provide a new home for the United Church of Canada head offices as part of the building that's being created on the grounds of their church. And uh, a massive project. Um, so they really wanted to look at their operating model as a church as a result of uh, new expenses and new income. So what the trends are. Um, and part of the challenge was they, they because of the redevelopment, they had to move out of their church for a period of two to three years. They're not back yet. And how do we, how do we best uh, address that? So the approach we took was to, first of all, build a common understanding of the financials. And you might think that's obvious, but quite often people don't perceive the financials the same. So we worked on that. And then we did some comparisons, uh, financials of other churches with public data, uh, some scenario analysis. We did some zero-based budgeting, which is when you start, let's assume you're not expending anything. Who's the first person you're going to hire? What's the first bill you have to pay? And you build up to the point where there's uh, that's how much money you have and you decide what's left over. So that's another analysis process. And also making sure that when people thought about cost allocations and other things, they had a a good understanding. That's Blue Street United Church. And again, a project over a number of months. Metropolitan United Church. Um, uh, this was uh, working with the board and trustees on capital budgeting. So not the operating budget, uh, but an old church building, sound familiar, uh, which is in need of over a period of 20 or 30 years of major repairs. How to plan around that. Um, how to discuss the needs and the prioritization what are the overall financials? How do you budget for that separate from operating? Uh, how do you fundraise for it? Uh, and just generally, you know, trying to create a plan that would allow them to not only have an operating budget, but a, a, a capital budget over time that would be uh, successful for them. Running United Church, that's my home church. So I put this in brackets. It wasn't really a mass project, but I did it. And my, so I figured I'd put it in as the experience we have. Uh, and in 2023, running Mead and Winner United uh, amalgamated. So I was part of the management team that led the process to decide upon and then implement that amalgamation. So that included, you know, creating an amalgamation agreement, uh, which also needs to be agreed with Shining Waters and a number of other parties. That was an important process. A communication decision with the congregations. You know, how do you bring people through this in a way that everyone feels heard um, and that uh, they, they understand what's going to be voted on and when and, and what the pros and cons are and all that. Ensuring as we brought two churches together, we had alignment on mission, uh, that we get agreement on how leadership would move forward, and then achieving financial operations and staff integration, the, the nuts and bolts. And then it took us nine months from the first talks to becoming operating to campus church. So it was a relatively short period of time, uh, and we all learned a lot. And that's you know, knowledge that you know can be imparted to other organizations and churches who want to go through that. Now I'm going to turn it over to, to Mark. 
So I did uh, two projects. Christ First is out in Mississauga, and they amalgamated, uh, another uh, familiar story, uh, two churches, two locations. They still have those two locations, and they were looking for a strategic plan. Um, so we did that. Interestingly, there was the service on a Sunday, and we had a nice lunch. And then right after that, we got the whole congregation together. And so they do uh, some social programs, uh, drop-ins and so forth for homeless people. Um, and one of the big issues for them, and I guess for many of you, is how to become uh, relevant in, I think the minister called a, a post-Christian world. Um, so that was uh, what we did there. And the next one was Cummer United a few years back. Uh, Cummer is up, uh, there may be a new subway station up there, just north of Finch. Um, and they also amalgamated, but what they had done was sold uh, the other building. And so lots of money became available for, well, the main building. And so they looked at renovations uh, and what they wanted to do. And so, again, we got the congregation together and they talked about priorities in terms of the space and how they wanted that to be used uh, and, and you know, what, what kinds of programs they could run there in this renovated church. Um, so those are the two projects I did. And again, both involved uh, right down at the congregation level, uh, because those are the people that got a stake in, in, these, uh, in these issues. Thank you, Mark. And so that really ends our, our presentation. We wanted to spend more time on community if we could. So, you know, ways forward. Um, any, everyone here and any other church is happy to contact Mass or me to discuss a potential project. So that's one action step. Um, or you can go to our website and open a project with us. Uh, Mark and I are also open to uh, working with the region, uh, either one, to do maybe a multi-church workshop on strategy or finance or some other topic of broad interest. That requires some coordination and so on. That would so we have to work on. Um, so there's really um, sort of a tactical way forward um, where any church can approach us and be happy to work with you. Or perhaps we can do something uh, across other churches uh, and multiple organizations. So uh, we're now going to enter the q and I'm going to stop sharing because uh, there's no need to have this screen up in front of us. So I'm going to drop that away. Um, Just to, so to Brian's point about that project, you know, we think that there's wisdom in the crowd. And that crowd could be your congregation. It could be your staff. It could be your leadership team. Or it could be other churches. And you're all keen, I presume, to learn from each other. So part of that could be how do we uh, move forward with with a sort of positive direction where sharing of ideas is is a big part of it. Thank you, Mark. So I'm Melody um, and everyone. Uh, hopefully that's been a useful introduction to to Mass. Uh, we'll be really very happy to uh, hear any questions and try to answer them. And they. It can be particular to your church in the sense of would this make sense as a project? You don't want to go too deep on that. Uh, or you can uh, ask questions about in general what we do and what's possible. So Melody, over to you and see if there's any questions. Yeah. So uh, I see that Constance, you have your hand up. So I'm going to ask you to unmute and then I'll. Oh, thank you very much for the presentation. Do you do follow up? A lot of your presentations stopped with the creation of a strategic plan or this or that. But I find the difficulty is in instrumentaling that and, and the follow-up. So I was yeah. wondering, do you yeah. follow up? Yes. If that's something that uh, you wish, we absolutely do that. Um, so uh, in some cases, what Mark and I see is a sequence of projects. Um, we'll go in, we'll do a strategic plan. And then next year they come in and say, well, you know, there's really a lot of HR implications. Could you work with us on staffing? And then the thing is, well, could you help us on operating plan? So um, you're quite right. There's a there's a, there's a need for sort of multiple check-ins. It's up to you. So we're happy to be engaged either as an individual or as an organization over a period of time to help you implement um, objectives, or uh, we can be one and done. That's really up to you. The other is uh, when I do a strategic plan, and you've seen them, they take the three or four pages. Here's your mission statement and your goals. And then there's usually three or four major strategic directions well, that's where we can finish. When I do them, I like to take it a little bit farther and uh, you know, assign committees or uh, assign people that are gonna lead each of those strategic directions or try and come up with some specific objectives for the next year. Depends on how much time the group has, ha has uh, but we wanna leave you with 
a, a little more than just here's your strategic plan, but here's some actual action steps that the team is going to go ahead and implement. Mark and I in mass don't believe on binders on shelves. That's not our. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's not our. Well, not and our the other mind. thing, I, maybe you've got a sense of this. We're not writing these plans. You know, we, we are facilitating the process where we're working with you. And we do have some specific expertise, particularly in that finance area that, that Brian talked about and HR. Uh, but when it's the strategic plan, you know, it's got to be owned by the board, the council, the congregation, whomever. Uh, and so we want to make sure that that happens. So it's not, as he said, a binder sitting on a shelf. Yeah, and where we're most effective is when we're co-leading with leaders from the organization, obviously, and facilitating that. And and we're good at asking questions. God bless. We're good at asking questions and trying to prompt things and and so on. Um, but yeah, we it's definitely done hand in hand. So well, I'm just looking to see if there's anyone with their hand raised, or I don't see anything in the chat just yet. Mark and I are never this clear. So that's, <laughs> I see uh, Julie. Yeah, hi Julie. Okay, me? Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. hi, Julie. <laughs> uh, I, I have uh, two questions. One is if any of your uh, group of 50 live anywhere, like I'm, our church is in Sudbury, Ontario. Anybody live closer to us in Sudbury or Northern Ontario? And the second question I have is, do you have you ever done or has anybody in your group ever done any projects in conjunction with um some uh a, somebody that the church has hired but we're needing assistance in extra facilitation for example uh let me, let's talk the first question um uh, most of our consultants are in the gta i don't know anyone uh, that far north in Sudbury. i've done remote projects in vancouver uh, manitoba um, uh, Northern Ontario, um, Southern Ontario. Um, to Mark's point, it, it depends on the nature of the project. Um, some things can be done very well uh, remotely, and in, in some cases, even some planning things. If it requires in person, then in general, uh, people are only going not too far to the GTA, but can do it remotely. Uh, in terms of working, uh, Mark, you want to add anything to that? Work with the well, uh, in Sudbury, are you familiar with the Sudbury Indie Cinema? I am a proud member of Sudbury Indie Cinema. Well, the building got sold or something, right? No, 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 no. Last minute, last minute decision. And the landlord gave us another three years. So we have three years. Hot like darn. It was really a Hail Mary at the end. No, we have a three year reprieve. <laughs> okay, good. Well, maybe I got to be back in touch with the group. So uh, for those others... Uh, it's an independent cinema. It's been this old school from way back and it, somebody owns it. And part of it was turned into this independent cinema. Why am I saying all this? Because I went up there and did a project with them. So I drove up, stayed overnight, went to a movie there and then worked with the team the next day. So some of us are prepared to do that. And I think I absorb the expenses on that. Sometimes we say, well, can you pay for a little bit of travel or or the hotel or something like that. So, um, you know, I would go up to Sudbury again. It's not that far. And, um, uh, you know, it's different if we're going out to Winnipeg or something like that. So it really depends. Can can you make this uh, attractive sounding project and find the right person who's prepared to drive a little or fly or train or whatever to, to get to your location? So uh, I may be back to Sudbury to help that group out again. Yay, and, good. And and what we, we recommend is is when the request goes in, if you really think in person is important, you state that and you state your location. And we share that with our volunteers. I mean, everyone has different life experiences and circumstances. Some can travel and some would welcome that. Some would say, gee, I can't do that. So uh, we're open to it, but we just can't guarantee it. Uh, on working with others, um, uh, sure. Um, uh, um, we want to make sure we're not stepping on people's toes. So if you hire a person to do a project, bring us in to help them, that might be a bit interesting. Um, uh, but uh, we're open to working with whomever your church um, uh, is engaging with. It could be a volunteer, it could be a consultant, an employee, you know, we're open to all that. Uh, but we will we'll be pretty crystal clear up front what our role is going to be and make sure that we understand what other people's roles are so that in the end we can deliver what we think is important. Does that answer the question, Julie? Nodding your head. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you. Julia says yes. Um, and we've got a question from Marty in the uh, in the chat. What costs does the church need to cover? So 
So I know that that was on an earlier slide, but perhaps Brian, you could address, sure. you know, so, the, uh, the, the way this sure. works. So the way it works is the consulting is free. Um, we uh, we ask at the end of every project if people are able to make a donation, we'd welcome that. It's not required. Um, some organizations can't afford that, and that's why we're here. We're trying to help those who can't afford. Um, and some who can't afford are generous. So, you know, it sort of works out. Um, if there are direct costs, like travel costs, then we would generally ask the, the organization, the church, to, to cover that. Um, voluntary consultants are not going to charge for subway tickets typically, but if you're going to go to Subway, then, you know, maybe that might come up. Um, uh, but there's no other real costs that uh, are going to be borne. It's we give of our time because this is what we enjoy doing. And and our our donations from uh, our volunteers and from our, 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 our clients are enough for us to uh, pay for half time, part time um, ED and uh, same as an office administrator. So we try to keep our costs very low um, so that we're not burdened by trying to do that. And we're in good shape. There's another question we have in the in the chat, is there a limit to the number of times an organization can access services during the year? Uh, no, uh, the only practical limit is you may overwhelm our capacity, um, <laughs> but um, we we will occasionally have two projects with one organization at the same time, three different consultants. Um, it just typically it's more likely to be a serial process, but if they're parallel, then we can do that in parallel. Um, and it's just basically capacity based. Um, it's whatever we can offer. And there are times, and Mark alluded to this, where sometimes we can't find someone for a project. You know, the, the three or four or five people that have the expertise are all busy right now. So we have to sometimes go back and say, love to help you. Could we do that in November? Because we're sort of booked until then. But we're very transparent on it. We're not trying to hide anything. We just may not have uh, the staffing at that time. And I guess another point, if we don't think we can help, we will tell you. So for instance, we don't offer legal advice. You know, um, uh, that's just part of our, our charter. That's not something we can do. Um, and we'll offer financial insights and so on, but we won't do an audit review because we're not CAs and CPAs. We're not going to perform that function, which is required um, uh, to have that kind of license. So those are two areas we sort of won't go into. Anything else, if you ask us a question, we'll try to tell you that's something that uh, we can help with. And if I can add to that, um, Brian, that uh, they will uh, function within the uh, the bounds of the manual of the United Church of Canada. So they are not going and go against the um, the uh, the policies that we have in place. To the best of our ability. And we hope to be obviously guided uh, always by the church. Uh, I'm, I'm deeply embedded and perhaps know the whole policies by heart. Uh, Mark, in other words, would not necessarily. Um, so it's always important for people to share whatever policies they're being governed under uh, so we can know that. And I did see in the in the chat are the slides available. Uh, we're making the slide deck available uh, so that the, both regions can put it on their website. So you'll be able to receive this PDF at some point when Melody, whomever, puts it up. Uh, so that's available. Um, and if you have other questions, you can also go to our website, which offers some more information. Yeah, so, so we are recording this session tonight and the recording will be also posted on our websites, both of the uh, regions. And you go for an Emmy, so we want lots of reviews. Are there any other questions that we could address for anyone on the call? I wonder if we could flip that around and ask uh, the group. Uh, we talked about doing something where everybody got together and we found some inter-group project here in Toronto. It's a day-long workshop or something. Um, I just want to gauge the interest in that. Uh, could we do thumbs up or comments or both or someone help me with that well maybe just if that would be something of interest just just do a wave and melody if you can see everybody just yeah, give us i can up. take a look so we see we can't a see few everybody. people yeah we do see a few people waving thumbs up um if there was a and again i i have the pleasure of knowing some of the respondents uh that are from a, a vast geographical Oh, yeah, Sean, could you, Sean's just in the chat. Can you give us a little more detail, Mark, on what that might look like? Well, um, we, yeah. we don't know, but I probably like a, a one day workshop or something like that. And and it's on strategic planning, but it's where everyone can benefit. Right. Yeah, and it's it's inter church, so to speak, if that's the expression you use, where, you know, we're, we're getting people to share ideas with each other and see if there's 
not some way for everybody to benefit rather than just individually. So uh, we don't know what that might look like, but it, but it's the idea is rather than working with one right. not, uh, church at a time, then we're working with a whole group of you together. So this, we, might, we, this might arise some dialogue that each region has with its its churches and identifying things and so on. Um, I think what I guess Mark's statement is you know, we can work in two ways. We, our traditional way is that. We do workshops. I do a workshop on financial sustainability. I do things on board governance and, and Mark has his own portfolio of things. So, you know, I think we start one church at a time. You know, if you have an interest, you know, please come forward and try to help. If it looks like through the regions or the conversations, it could be something uh, more common, then Mark and I would put together a proposal and say, how about something like this? And just see if it had any legs. So we don't know what that would be today. You know, we're just putting that out. Our, our projects do tend to be proactive, uh, sorry, reactive. That is, that request comes into us, it gets circulated, and someone picks it up. But there's also an interest in the organization of being a little more proactive. Do we see a need out there that exists or in here a sort of commonality? And is there something we can do to start moving that forward to be a little more proactive rather than just sitting back and waiting for the request to come in? Yeah, and I so see in the chat a... some things on governance and facilitation. Hi, yeah. Constant. Someone said fundraising. So we could do that fundraising one. Again, I do that in a big six hour session uh, or two, three hour chunks. Uh, so that could be one, uh, for instance. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Constance, yes. Um, this is really awkward because I don't know how to say it. But one of the great strengths of the United Church is the energy of the volunteers who have stepped forward, who have worried about finance, who have worried about trustees and stewardship and the committees, et cetera. But some of the church churches have gotten quite large and the liabilities are quite important. And it seems to me that there is a need to transition to the idea of having, uh, whether you call him a, a manager or a CEO or a president, but a professional mm -hmm. person who is going to insert himself or herself into the organogram of the church. Mm -hmm. And I find that there is a great deal of resistance saying, we don't want that person to be taking decisions and making, telling us what to do because we do it, we're the volunteers. How much experience do you have in making that transition from a, a, a church which would be smaller in which the ministers and the volunteers would be the important people into something which is actually more professionally managed, not to say that that takes away the, the responsibility of the volunteer board or the ministers, but someone who can work in conjunction with them. I find this really a, a fascinating you know, conjuncture, but difficult. It is. Um, I'm working with one church on that topic right now, um, dealing with the, the issue of how do we manage and uh, not just uh, um, sort of delegate out to volunteers and so on, um, and the the trade-offs and the organizational issues that arise from that, uh, and they're in that transition. Um, so I have some experience with that, and between, between Mark and I and others, maybe not in churches, but we've seen that kind of thing before. So that's the kind of thing that we'd be open to trying to help address. Um, uh, you know what? You know one of the things that I think I see in the church that's not a great insight is there's a lot of consolidation, amalgamation, merger activity, um, just because the realities that we're all facing. Um, and uh, even if that's not happening uh, in the larger churches, it is it's feeling a need to become more professional, um, and it comes across in a variety of different ways. Uh, it could be a management, it could be upgrading accounting systems, it could be different governance. You know, there's lots of elements of that. Uh, they're associated with uh, getting into larger scale. So I think those are things where we could help. Um, uh, no silver bullet, but I think we'd be uh, could be helpful to that. It's a common issue in other not-for-profits. There's a board of directors and there's an executive director, and maybe the board is wanting this direction, but the executive director started this organization from their kitchen, you know, 35 years ago, and is still involved, and the board members rotate through. So sometimes you get that long-term history and sensitivity about this founder. Uh, so we've dealt with all those kinds of things. As a facilitator, what I like to do is find out what's behind the story, what's behind the issues. And if you and I've got different techniques for doing that to find out what's really on people's minds. And once you can identify those, then you can start to create some strategies for improvement, whatever that might look like. 
And, you know, we, we as mass, we have the advantage of being outside. You know, we can ask questions other people can't ask um, because you know, we're not a member of the congregation or a volunteer at that organization. So um, that can be helpful. Um, and um, amongst all our volunteers is a fairly good level of experience dealing with the politics of life. And we always know there's no politics in churches. Thank goodness, I can say. Thank goodness. <laughs> That's true. Um, so um, we, a good deal of my consulting, I suspect the same with Mark, is dealing with the people issues, you know? So, you know, for, so who's supporting this project? Well, most people are supportive of it. So who's support, who's not supportive of it? Like, and why? And you start getting into the fact that you're not going to be welcome with open arms into every single meeting. Um, but that's part of the, the upfront discussion of what's the scope what we're trying to do. And in some cases, profit, nonprofits and charities and churches, and they know the answer, they can't get there. They need a, a process to get them to that answer. In some cases, they don't know the answer and they really, it's a, a diagnosis, the problem solving exercise. Sometimes it's somewhere in the middle, you know? So um, what we try to do based on our experience, uh, and Mark and I, I, you know, 30, 40 projects, probably, he's probably more than that by far. Um, we try to upfront, try to figure out what really has to happen here to be successful and try to share that and get agreement on that before we go ahead. So I just Thank want you. to draw our attention to, to the chat where some folks have been responding to Mark's mm. invitation to consider mm. what a, a group, a gathering might look like or what might attract folks. Um, so there's a training yep. facilitators, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's a few pieces here around yeah. governance and yeah. Definitely. And so I guess to, to Mark's point, I, we just wanted to, we wanted to make you aware that we can proceed in two different ways. Um, the the tactical individual church, you can make that call tomorrow and uh, a phone call and, and an email, whatever, and get underway. Um, if it's something that is more of common interest, we would have to work with the regions, I think, to try to figure yeah. out what that might be. And we'd be happy to do that. Um, you have a sense of the kind of things we do, we do work in. And, you know, there are some things which are pretty common. Um, other things, not so much. So that would have an impact as well on, uh, on what we can do. Are there any other questions we could help with? Oh, I see David. I think you have your hand up. Oh, you have to. There we go. Hi, David. Uh, is it Mark or Brian who will tell us at Knox United Church and Agent Court how we can get more people attending church? It's going to take Mark and Brian, everybody we know. Yeah, that's <laughs> cool. and, and, you know, I mentioned Christ first, first. They're wrestling with it. I think all of you are. There's no simple answer to that um, when you think about immigration trends, when you think about uh, different types of religions, your group, what, what you stand for. But th that intrigues me. And if we could, there's not a silver bullet, but if we can find that and work with you folks, uh, I think there's a big opportunity there. Uh, that the United Church can stand for something very special and attract new people. Uh, we can help you explore that. It's not not a simple answer, but there's a bunch of things you can do. Yeah, because it always involves a combination of mission and vision. How do you contrast with other choices people are making? Uh, how do you let people yeah. know you exist? All that stuff, you, which you know. So. We Next week, we're meeting with a local uh, Anglican Presbyterian and Baptist Church to oh, share ideas where uh, uh, we've had considerable discussion and part of it centers around we're not, the United Church of Canada is not the only organization that is seeing a decline in attendance. That's yeah. um, uh, a phenomenon that's uh, right across the board as far as for the most part. So what what are what's driving it? Like why why do we not see people going to church? We we feel that it, it's not necessarily a lack of spirituality or interest in in uh, spirituality, but there are other factors. So we want to, as part of stewardship, not only trying to raise the money that we need to keep going, but uh, getting more people into the church. I, I can actually give you the answer now. If you all want to get your pencils out, I'll give you the answer. I spoke recently with a, a fellow from Procter & Gamble way back who ran a church in uh, Cincinnati for quite a number of years. 
and he was the, the pastor there, I guess, and um, it's sort of non-affiliated with others. Uh, anyway, so we talked about that. Here's the simple answer. Respond to the needs of your community. That's going to be successful. And so we can help guide you to figure out what those needs are. How can you do that? How can you be strategic? And I'll just mention too as well that with these supports, and this is a this is a little segue to to remind folks that uh, the United Church doesn't leave you bereft in some of these areas. Um, responding to David's question around growth, we do have um, denominational growth animators. Callan Law is in Shining Waters and Canadian Shield, specific to growth animation. Um, and I do stewardship support uh, in the field as well. So I'm really excited to to be working, you know, at the invitation and to work collaboratively with folks like Brian and Mark, should should that be something that would be helpful to congregations? Mm -hmm. And also, in addition to what uh, Melody says, David, who's the uh, chairperson of uh, your congregation, David? Who's the uh, chair of the board or the council you have? Are you the chair? I am. Yeah, chair. You are. Okay. Who? I will be uh, sending a letter to your uh, church uh, tomorrow. Oh, that great. I have sent all the churches in Scarborough area. So we will collaborate together. So, um, well, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, very much appreciate it. Okay. It's, it's, it's a real problem. It's only occupied 25% of every board meeting I've been in for 30 years. So I, I, <laughs> anybody hasn't solved that by now. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions that we can address for, uh, for people on the, on the call? You may have run again. Oh, Julie has a question again. It wasn't, it wasn't so much a question, but just sort of more of a comment in response to Mark, what you just said about uh, the, the pastor who said, you know, respond was respond to the needs of your community. And one of the challenges, um, again, to something you alluded to earlier is if, if I think of community, not just as, for example, Sudbury, but the church community. And are we really listening? I mean, I keep saying again and again and again, you know, somebody will only say so many times what they would like to see as a change at church. Mm -hmm. And if they're not getting it, they might go elsewhere or they just might stay home. Yeah. And, you know, I, I can't help but notice if, if we look at who's on this, as as in many of these Zoom calls that I'm doing, um, you know, we're we're sort of the, I guess the committed people that are coming to church. We're in positions of authority and and whatever, and we probably have a lot of the same concerns, including the fact that you know younger people don't consider church the be all and end all that their parents or grandparents um, did. So. You know, I'm always so, so concerned about the person that will will be brave enough to speak up, but it's sometimes very hard for them to be heard because people don't want to hear that. They don't often, <laughs> as much as we'd like to think there can be, you know, people want change. It's it's at least, you know, we see some, there's, there's sometimes a core group of people that, um, are just so adamant against it. And yet, you know, it's, you get to a point like indie cinema. I mean, it was, it was this close week, couple of weeks to closing before and moving somewhere else. And so you know, I mean, mass, what mass can do is we can, we can help, um, you know, we create focus groups, we can do surveys, we can try to do that, but obviously the, the, the church must be open to the process and must want to hear the answers and then do something about them. So, you know, we can help in, in any way, but uh, these these are difficult challenges. You know, being sustainable in this day and age, uh, growing membership, rejuvenation, uh, leadership, uh, assignment, volunteer burnout, we see all of that, I see it every day, right? So, you know, Mass is um, a tool, it's uh, something that might help you in addressing some of these things. No silver bullets, maybe one for uh, for for Mark. But uh, you know, our 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 goal is really to to uh, to help. Um, we have our own insights, uh, and we can help the process. So uh, that's us.
Thank you, Brian and Mark. Um, this was wonderful. And uh, this is the intention of both regions to do this educational um, events uh, with the leaders within our uh, churches in, in both regions. So, so next one is um, next October 2nd, Wednesday. Um, that is Wednesday, October the 2nd and seven o'clock. And um, the the topic is the, um, the follow up of the one that we did with the, um, Dr. Betty Priest about where two and three are gathered, there is Jesus and conflict. So this is a part two of that uh, webinar that we did last um, June. So if you haven't received the information how to register, just um, let me know, let uh, Melody know. Uh, Diane also, uh, then we will um, we will send the uh, reminder email out to all of you anyway, but if you need uh, a link to register, please let us know. And also um, there are some uh, specific topics that you would like to um, address in the future. Please let the uh, regional staff know as well. Um, so thank you, Brian and Mark, for coming uh, tonight. It was wonderful. So as we are blessed with the offerings of the gifts uh, from Mass, let us go in deep gratitude for such gifts. And let us go in enthusiastic energy for the gift of ministry that we are all called to serve our God and our neighbor. May the blessings of God, the creator, the liberator, and the sustainer be with us all tonight and tomorrow and forever and, and ever. Amen. Amen.